Welcome to Video Church. We've been kind of off the air and off the grid, so to speak, because of personal health reasons that I've been in the hospital, I've been out of the hospital, I've been in the emergency room, I've been out of the emergency room. I've had to take care of myself and then be taken care of, as well as to work with doctors and go through a major surgery. So it's been a little bit of challenge to come back to that with which God has given me to do. So here at Vivo Church, we like to say a lot of introduction things by way of if we don't already have a intro proposed, in other words, something that says a lead-in for this video, then, and we don't have a exit video, you know, editing done onto it, then sometimes I have to go about maybe explaining a little bit about what we're doing. Most people, whether you understand it or not, or whether you know it or not, have certain expectations of pastors, preachers, ministers, those that are sharing what they've learned or what they have been anointed, maybe appointed to do when it comes to the ministry of giving to you, the viewer, that with which they're doing and maybe they've recorded as a live service or as a part of what their ministry of being a Christian is like. Video Church would like to just simply say, hey, our purpose was already begun in video. So we plan on having live services secondary to that. So we have, as it were, at Video Church, all outdoor services live, but sometimes with Utah Video and with Video Ministries, we have to record some things indoors. And that's what we're doing right now because of the challenges that I face on going outdoors right now until my health improves a little bit more because it's a little cold outside and right now the place that God has provided for us is being used and temporarily we may come indoors in order to record these and then go back outdoors as summer approaches. Now, who am I? Lots of times people say, well, who are you? And most of the time I just say, ah, you know, just Google me, you know. And if you Google Michael James Stone, you'll find me. But most of the time I'll tell you to Google Video because in the early days of what I was called to do, I recorded many videos that was under and by the Spirit of God anointing me in such a way that it was a powerful devotional ministry that he gave me to record seven devotions or more per day during a short period of time. And in the intensity of that moment, God gave me a, you could call an extra measure of faith. He so overwhelmed me with his Holy Spirit that, wow, I even watch those videos now. And frankly, I get taught by them. So if you're expecting me today to be like I was under that anointing, Maybe I am. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> you see, there are certain times that I've been trying to teach people or to tell people or to talk to people about certain golden eras, a certain golden age or time, like when David was at his prime or Chuck Smith was in his certain venue where it's just like, wow, it was amazing. And they record it and they keep it for a certain series, you know, that they'll tell you, well, this is according to the 5,000 series that was renamed from the 3,000 series that was, you know, kind of bumped up to edit it this out. So, you know. Or, you know, in other places like Chuck Missler in his early days, you know, I mean, or, you know, different men of God that at some point in time, God used them mightily. And then later on, they kind of either decline or they increase or they must decrease that others might increase. So you see, there might be a time where you're good at one thing and not good at another. And then maybe God says, hey, I don't want you to do that thing. I want you to do this thing. And so you're no longer good at that thing, but you try to do it anyways. And it's not as good as what you were in the beginning. Or perhaps 
at that time that God wanted to use it for the rest of your life. Bibo Ministries, anything that has the Bibo only label on it, technically, or Bibo Tozer, Bibo Meditations, those kind of things, technically for me is that kind of anointing. It was like that particular time period. I can't duplicate it. I don't try to go back and redo. But God seems to have a purpose for it that he still wants to use to the body of Christ and to unbelievers as well. So you'll see many times that we'll refer to Vidivo and Vidivo Ministries and still use that in Vidivo Church and the fact that we're here in Utah now. Um, share that or relate that because it so effectively touches people's lives that Jesus speaking through me to them, I'm amazed because I even watch them now and I get spoken to and I get changed. And that's why there's always this process of change and rearrange going on in our ministry. Now, here at Vivo tonight, this being Wednesday, normally we have Wasatchers, you know, Wasatchers! I always like to say Wasatchers. I like that word. But it's from the Wasatch Mountain Range and people that live according to their location, usually somewhere along this mountain range, you know, the Wasatch Mountain Range. And we like to say from the rising of the sun over the Wasatch Mountain Range to the setting thereof over the Great Salt Lake Basin, the name of the Lord shall be praised. Because I currently am residing in the state of Utah. And I'm thrilled. I'm blessed. I'm amazed. God sent me here. God blessed me here. And God is using me here. And so I, I like that. I like to be where God's blessing is. I like to be under the spout where the blessings come out, you know, and don't get me wrong, I mean, it could be that you may want to be, you know, financially blessed. Maybe some of you want to be emotionally blessed, some spiritually blessed. But I got news for you. When it comes to me, when I say I'm blessed, I mean, I am, whoa, wow, way, dude, way blessed. And that can mean in all the rest, including in the Word of God, as well as financially, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Which right now, I'm a little under the weather, but that's a long story. Now, in Video Bible, which is what we're recording this for, we're not going to immediately put this Wednesday night study that I'm doing right now in Zephaniah into the format of Video Bible. I'm going to say to you that this is Video Bible, the book of Zephaniah, simply because down the road, when I have time, when there's more opportunity to put it into the precursor of the, the material that we have in the beginning so that it sets up for the teaching in Zephaniah and then we have in the end, I don't ever edit the videos, per se, or the videos, as we like to say, because the video is a video devotional, and I think that any time that you have a Bible study, you're sharing devotionally what your video is of the response you have to what God is teaching you and how you want to present that to the people as an offering and a sacrifice to God so that they might be blessed and received from Him by way of the Spirit changing their heart and their eyes and their ears to understand what it is you're saying. And even you, being the teacher or the preacher or the minister, don't know what it is that's going to minister to them, so you allow God, by way of His Holy Spirit, to interpret it for you, to them, and by way of His working through you with what He's done in your life, you're able to do that. Some more formatted than others, some more inductive or selective or deductive than others, but irregardless, or regardless, as the word actually is said, I always say irregardless because I just don't think it's a real word, but it sounds good. It's one of those words we use that really isn't a word, irregardless. The word is regardless, <laughs> but I like to say irregardless. It just sounds better. And I know it's not a word, but the fact of the matter being such that we know that the Spirit of God is what teaches the people of God about the Word of God that reveals Jesus. There is no other person that does that. It's not your pastor, it's not your church, it's not your teacher, it's not me, it's not the preacher, it's not whatever you think it may be or the Bible. But it is, in fact, he who is pulling back in these latter days that there's lesser of a hindrance to evil going on in the world than what was before, and it's going to continue until one day that, poof, the Spirit is just called home, or called back to heaven, 
and they which are caught up in the Spirit, that are led by the Spirit, that are walking in the Spirit, will be taken with him into heaven in a snatching away of those that are chosen to be spared of those things that are going to come upon the earth. Some people call that the rapture. Some people call it the snatching away. Some will say harpazo. Some will pay rapturos. The fact of the matter is, not everyone's going. A lot of people and the majority of Christians that you know, including maybe you, will remain behind. And they that which remain behind will have to answer for the fact that they have not made Jesus Lord of their life, but that they have some other things that God requires of them to do. Maybe you left your first love. Maybe you're not doing the things you know you should be doing, and that might be what keeps you behind. I don't know. The criteria with which God has said that we could look at in order to be examined to prove whether we're in the faith or not is according to the measure of faith we've been given, what did we do with what Jesus said? What Jesus said is located in the Sermon on the Mount. That determines whether or not we're going in the rapture, determines whether or not we're faithful to him, it determines whether or not we are what people say as true Christian. It determines where your place is in the body of Christ, whether you're the bride or the, you know, cast aside, you know, kind of like, Dare I say, in the body of Christ, there is what's called the afterbirth. In other words, if you were born inside of a woman, then you know that there's a certain amount of stuff that was kept that you were like inside of a sack, you know, and you were kind of like, you know, umbilical cord. Kind of this afterbirth that gives birth to you, the physical being that you are. The church is the afterbirth of the bride of Christ. After the rapture, the afterbirth will be left behind. It was good for what it was meant for during the time before the rapture. It's not going to accomplish much after the rapture. So they which remain have to overcome by the word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, and loving not their lives even unto death. And of course, refusing the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of his name, whether it be chosen to be implanted upon their hand or their forehead, whether it's a chip or an emblem, whether it's even just a simple tattoo. No matter what you do, you don't want to do any of those things. There's three that will condemn you. The name of the beast, the number of the beast, and the mark of the beast. Those are the three. So, otherwise, what you have to do is to love the Lord your God and to love Him even unto death, to share your testimony and to trust in the blood of the Lamb that was shame shed for you by way of the grace and mercy that he's given to you so you could survive and overcome in that great tribulation. But that's not what we want to talk about. Those are, as I said, setting up for video Bible, but putting you into remembrance of the things you should already know. If you don't know these things, then you should study to show thyself approved, a workman that, not be, that need not be ashamed, but you would rightly divide the word of truth according to the time periods it's supposed to be in. According to what we know based upon the entire volume of the book from cover to cover, if it so be that the Spirit of God has been teaching you about the word of God that is to the people of God, to reveal the Son of God, Jesus, then you know that it's all about Jesus from cover to cover, from beginning to end. The history is his story, as we make cliches of it, but these cliches that I bring to you sometimes are accurate about it being his story and history, because it is his story. It's his story of what God has revealed to us by way of his plan of creation and salvation and sanctification and in the end justification by way of bringing to us the unification of his plan from Genesis all the way through Revelation until we come into that unification with God to be one with him and he with us and one in us and us in him. So until that time, we do take portions of the scripture and read them and examine them to see if there's something that we could learn from them. And Zephaniah is going to be that book that we do tonight. As a matter of fact, I just realized these glasses aren't any better than those other glasses. And wow, these glasses are fine. But having said that, I can reach over here to my handy dandy, snazzy little kind of like, you know, I had this whole cut rack, you know, kind of like thing, you know, where you have these little squares, you know, you put little pigeonhole squares in. I have a whole bunch of glasses in there. <laughs> Reading glasses. Oh, wow, I can't read with those. Reading glasses. Glasses that I used to use. Glasses that I want to use. 
sunglasses, other glasses, all kinds of glasses, just in case I need them, because you never know when you'll find yourself, as you get older, without glasses. Oh, wow, I can't see out here, but I can see in there. Hey, may the Lord thy God give you eyes to see with which you'll be able to read his word. Boy, does that stand out. Now, the way we're going to do video Bible is we're just... Let me explain something to you about Calvary chapels, where I come from. Let me explain to you something about inductive and deductive reasoning as well. But we'll just talk, okay, you and I. We're just rapping, as it were. We're just... I'm giving you kind of like a, a heads-up shortcut, okay? So, if you're in a church, you know, and you like your pastor, well, you probably like him for any number of reasons. You might like him because he's a nice guy, and maybe you had dinner with him, and you visited with him, and, you know, you kind of like that. Or maybe you like the pastor because he doesn't bother you. He's standing up behind the pulpit, teaching, according to what he says, it's really preaching, but teaching, and, you know, you're getting a lot out of it, and you're going along with it, and that's good. That could be why God has you there. If God doesn't have you there, you'll be disagreeing with what the pastor said, you won't feel comfortable, you won't like it, and you'll go somewhere else. Maybe right away, maybe later. But if that's not where you're supposed to be, you'll figure it out pretty soon or later. Now, when it comes to the Internet, though, when it comes to videos, when it comes to ministries, when it comes to those things that we can examine and then decide if we want to watch or learn from, that's where Vidivo and Video Ministries and Vidivo Church comes into being. We automatically have been called to and sent to the Internet, primarily, to start with, in video ministry, to minister to those people that are on the Internet through Blogger and social media and a variety of ways. Something just happened on my computer, so I don't know if I'm still recording. It's like, okay, what's going on with the computer? Praise the Lord. Now, if I'm continuing to record, which I believe that I am, then my computer just simply switched screens in order to make me aware that the editing of one of our other versions is done, and I can upload that. So I'll continue on in the study and assume that this is correct. So when you have your pastor or your church and all that, they're good for something. They're good for the purpose they were designed. But if you're choosing to find something else and something more, when you need to learn more, you don't necessarily have to go to another church or move on or move up. I myself like to say this about video Bible. If you... <clears throat> don't know your Bible, then, you know, get a church that teaches the Bible. But don't expect the church to do it. If your pastor isn't into going through Genesis to Revelation, just watch a video. Go to another site, on on website, you know, maybe not video church, but, you know, a Calvary Chapel or somebody, I don't care who, you know, it doesn't matter, whatever you choose. But, you know, we, pro we promote a lot of things at video church education department, like uh, when your audio Bible that has phenomenal material or when your Bible blog that you can read and see and they put videos and commentary and back and forth stuff or you know other things Bible buddy that just reads the Bible there are a lot of materials that are out there but check it out you know go on the web and get what you need in order to study the Bible on your own but study on your own then if you want to at your church get involved and you have something to participate with you know you're learning you're a part of the body of Christ so here at Video Church, we don't feel like we have to go through the same format that Calvary Chapel does. We don't feel like we have to set up the Word with worship, you are set, you know, got all this program stuff, you know, we're doing a program and the worship leaders program, and, you know, we got three songs of this, you know, and then two songs of this and one of that. And then we kind of throw it all together and we're really singing for ourselves, kind of singing so that you'll inspire and follow along, but maybe not, you know. And we repeat twice, maybe three, and that's it, you know, and then move on, quick, you know, blah, blah, blah. And in the past, the same thing. You know, well, you know, this week we're in this book, and in this week we're in that book, and then we go to this book, and we go line by line, precept upon precept, concept upon concept. You know, the line upon line, precept precept, was a slam against the children of Israel, not a benefit. So I agree in one way, you should learn from a Calvary chapel, but not all Calvary chapels are good at teaching the Bible. I got news for you, there's some pastors that really ought to quit teaching. <laughs> what? Yes. You know, I, I don't know where they came from. You know, I don't know where they were taught. I don't know, you know, I mean, God knows they, they want to be a pastor. I see that. They went to Calvary Chapel Bible College, you know. They learned how to do inductive studies. They have the format down. They have the formula down. They are saying the right things, but there's no power. 
There's no spirit. There's no life from it. It's just principles. Well, these are the seven things of the twelve things of the thirteen things of the two things of the one thing that I want to tell you. By the way, that isn't found in the Bible, but that's one of the principles that I get out of inductive Bible study, that I have an outline that i got to go by, and because my outline is on my digital recorder, you know, and I have it right here. Well, now let's get to principle number two, and then we'll jump back to number one. Oh, we can't go out of order. That's right. Okay, so principle two is followed by principle three. by You know, no matter how schmooze the presentation is, if you're giving the Word of God without the power thereof to change lives and people aren't really being ministered to, It's intellect, stupid, not intelligence. Intelligence says, hey, I'm not that good. Go here. You know, and I'll tell you, you know, right, flat, flat out. You know, go to heaven or go to hell. You know, or, to put it bluntly, go to a better Bible teacher. If you want to know the Bible, I can give you all kinds of sources, you know, and routines and people that I would recommend. Hey, you want to study just the Bible and learn from just the Bible in a formula organized way, I got lots of them, and they, you know, really good at it, you know, and some, and the ones that I recommend, yes, they have the anointing, and so they are called to do that, so that's why we don't say, hey, follow me as I follow Jesus, ah, oh, man, I'm here to do what Jesus has told me to, to the ones that need what I have to share, which usually is more of a preaching, because pastors that say they're teaching aren't, they're preaching, they preach by way of standing up and standing before the people and declaring to you what they've learned. They're not declaring to you the word of the Lord. Let's be real. They're not declaring to you God's word and thus said the Lord. Their lives aren't at stake for what they're saying. So they're sharing with you about what they have learned, which is preaching, not teaching. Teaching is interactive. So I just want to make sure you understand that. That's why you'll see when we talk about video church or we start to come back to video Bible, we're not talking about like, hey, you know what, I'm going to do what you see Calvary do, or I'm going to do like, you know, you see some other person you're used to doing. I'm going to do what God tells me to do the way he wants me to do it, as I am the way I am, such as I am, that I am, that I am. I mean, that's why we're here, that I am. <laughs> you know, I'm not outside today, though we may go. <clears throat> because we're going to do it, and we're going to relate it, and we're going to share it as... God speaking from his throne through the least of his servants unto you. And if he does give you something you are blessed by, then rest in that with which he has given you. You don't have to get, you know, like we're studying the book of Zephaniah, the entire book, by the way, in case you're wondering why this takes so long. It's going to take a long time. But we're going through the entire book of Zephaniah tonight, today, right now, this place, you know, as you're watching But if you want it done like a Calvary Chapel, go to a Calvary Chapel. But don't pick one that's dead and dry and dusty. Pick one that breathes life to you, that you go, yeah. Matter of fact, there's one that, you know, I mean, I could tell you right now. If you go to Calvary Chapel, Laguna Creek, and you listen to Rich Chafin teaching, you're going to get Jesus. I mean, no doubt about it. I can say beyond any shadow, but I don't care what book he's in. I don't care where he's going. I don't care what he's teaching. I don't care where he is, what he's doing. He has the anointing. He has what God anointed him to do, and he knows it now. And he's doing it according to what God has told him to do. And he's just like right in the center of God's will for his life. Poof! Man, you watch him or listen, and you go, Wow, that was easy, and that was fun, and I like that, man. You know, and you check it off. But that doesn't mean you got to sell everything you have and, you know, move to Laguna Creek or wherever, I forget where it's at, outside of Sacramento, but anyway. You know, yeah, move there. You know, I mean, you can watch it on the Internet. You know, I mean, God's going to bless you, however you do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There's a reason why it's hearing and not just, you know, sitting in a pew. But whatever you do, according to the will of God, do it as unto the Lord. But do it when God sends you. Like God sent me from there to here. You know, and I'm here in Utah now. Well, while I got here, I helped a little kind of baby Calvary get started. You know, and God bless them, whatever they're doing. I hope they keep doing whatever they're doing. Because I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing it. You know, such as it is, it is. And, you know, God will use it for whatever is needed there at the time, according to the way that they do what they're doing, for the people that they need to do it to. But for me, I God raised up and said, here, I want you to do this free. This is going to be a testimony to me. And I went, well, that ought to tick some people off. <laughs> no money, honey? Oh, wow, man, everybody's going to yell at me. But 
he raised up Video Church. Now, Video Ministry I've always been doing, but Video Church he raised up. And it's meant to be for whatever purpose it's going to be, and he's accomplishing it according to his choice, because it's his church. So we're going to get into the book of Zephaniah now. Now, I want you to understand a video Bible also that we have an expression I've said four times today so far in this video. I think three, now we're going to make it four. But it, that is technically our prayer. It is an, a, a cutesy, you could say, way of, of writing a poem. It could be a scripture if you wanted to take each part apart you know, and realize that it does come from scripture and they're just bylines from scripture or lines of scripture. Um, but basically we say here at Video Church as our you know, underpining of what we do, the word of God by the spirit of God to the people of God of the Son of God, Jesus. That is our prayer. I mean, we don't have to pray every time and say, Oh God, by the Holy Spirit, would you please touch the people, touch the leader, touch the person, do this, do that, come here, come there, come everywhere and fill up, breathe those, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if we pray, praise the Lord, but in an attitude of prayer, when your life is continually praying and you're talking to God on a daily basis, on a continuing, ongoing basis, you don't have to make a demonstration of prayer. Jesus said, go in your closet, you know, go to, go to your bedroom and pray, go to your closet and pray, go in the bathroom and pray, but do it in secret, so your Father will reward you openly, so... Don't expect every time. Sometimes we pray, and then some people, some fool will say something on the internet to me, or my wife will say some silly thing like, "You pray such beautiful prayers," and then I'll go, "Fine, I'm not praying again for the next six years," because <laughs> you know, I mean, what? I mean, what's a beautiful prayer? I mean, come on. You know, if you want to sound like King James, fine, I could do that, or sound like Pharisees, sure too. You know, but let's be real. God knows your heart, so if you already have your heart right, then you just go with what God tells you to do, and you enjoy it as a normal conversation in communication with Him, because you sense Him, and you know He's in you. So with the Spirit of God in you, and the Spirit of God in me, let's get into the book of Zephaniah now. And I'm just going to read this intro to you, so that you kind of get a background understanding. Zephaniah is on page 903, no. Zephaniah is after Habakkuk. You know, I had to look for it for a while. I think it's the last book of the Bible. No, it's not. Um, it's Zephaniah, Haggai, Malachi. Zechariah, Malachi, I think. Yeah. You always go Habakkuk, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Or Zechariah, in that case, maybe. And then Matthew. So, kind of like near the, you know, kind of midway point between the Bibles, you know, kind of, well, you'll get it. Just look up Zephaniah, a table of contents, if you can't find it. If you got one of those. If not, well, you know, just flip around. You'll get there. But the authorship and context of the book of Zephaniah, according to this Bible, which I'm, you know, I could trust it. It's Nelson. You think I trust Bibles? But anyway, within reason, you know, most Bibles aren't that far off, you know, so I'm just going to read it. Zephaniah, the authorship and context, Zephaniah's name means Jehovah hides. Or in real life speaking, because it's got the Yah at the end of it, it would be Yahweh, or Yahweh, you know, hides, or Yahweh conceals, or Yahweh shelters, or Yahweh protects. So, what is written here is Zephaniah's name means Jehovah hides, meaning under shelters or as way of a protection. This great-great-grandson of the good King Hezekiah, although there are no good, so we'll just say King Hezekiah, prophesied during the reign of King Josiah of Judah, somewhere around the years 640 to 608 B.C. before Jesus including Josiah's Reformation, which began in 621 B.C. He was also related to King Josiah, who was a great-grandson of Hezekiah. Zephaniah thereby probably had access to the king's court and would have been influential in helping to bring about the Great Reformation, which unfortunately was more superficial than real. He was also a contemporary of Jeremiah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. You know, I always love the way they kind of talk about contemporary. They were around about the same time, may have they may have been in contact, they don't know if they were in contact, they think they were in contact, so they always speculate about the contact. If it doesn't say so, don't go so, so don't worry about so much things like that. Talked about a key verse, we're not going to go there. Um, how Zephaniah fits together, rampart lawlessness, profane worship, deceitful prophets, and virtually extinct religious convictions among the people, occasion this prophet's message. So we do understand now that we're talking about the prophet Zephaniah. You know, it says that Zephaniah was a flaming evangelist. Well, okay, now, you know, if you get some evangel out of this and some prophecy out of this, well, you know, you're kind of getting the picture here. 
you know, who preached effectively a message burning with repute so people were reluctant to respond. Yeah, sounds like a preacher, so we're right up our alley. In the midst of severe denunciation, he called for repentance, which alone could save the nation from impending doom. Kind of like what people do today, but I don't think that they understand what they're saying when they try to tell America how bad it is, when there's a lot of good that America does. you got to remember, we send out the most missionaries in the world, and we're the most humanitarian aid organization, the largest humanitarian aid organization there is since time began, really. I mean, put it bluntly, as far as monetary and number of people that actually help out disasters and floods and violence in the world. Finally, his thunder and sternness gave way to sweetness, love, joy, and triumph, and rest and salvation, as foretold the bright future that would ultimately be Judas. His book may thus be divided into certain blah blah blahs and blah blah blahs, with blah blah blahs here and a blah blah there and everywhere blah blah blah. Because that's what people do whenever they start to interpret things. You know, they start blah blah. And you just go, blah blah blah, blah blah blah, blah 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 blah. Now we'll get into the word of the Lord, because that's what it says, you know, and a lot of people nowadays want to go, thus saith the Lord, the word of the Lord. Well, when you say the word of the Lord, you're probably in bad company because unless it actually is those words, don't say the word of the Lord because it's not the word of the Lord. It's your word. God is working through you. That means you're using your words in order to explain what he's saying. So be careful when you say the word of the Lord. Make sure it's coming directly as a scripture out of the Bible. Otherwise, there's a warning about saying the word of the Lord or thus saith the Lord in the Bible. And most prophets, teachers, pastors, ministers forget that one where Jesus says, don't go saying it's his word, you know, unless, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, anyways, we're going to start off with Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, the son of Hushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. Well, that's a wake-up call. I will consume man. I will consume beasts. I will consume the birds of the heavens. I will consume the fish of the sea. I will cause the stumbling blocks along with the wicked, and I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. Ow! I don't know if I like Zephaniah already. It's kind of like, ooh, aren't we talking like wiping everything out? That's what it's about so far in verses 1, 2, and 3 when we're talking about what God is saying through the prophet Zephaniah to maybe you and me. It's really in the Great Tribulation, we do see that this is going to be fulfilled, don't we? Even as it was fulfilled later at the time of the, uh, time of Israel's um, captivity. I will stretch out my hand against Judah, and I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal, from this place. The names of the idolatrous priests and the pagan priests will I cut off, and those who worship the host of heaven on the mountaintops will I cut off, and those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord will I cut off, but also those who swear by Milcom will I cut off, those who have turned their back from following the Lord will I cut off, and those who have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him will I cut off. Ow! Does that sound like the end of the world to you? It sure does to me. Man, I had to have something to drink to get that taste out of my mouth. There's a lot of cutting off going on. Off with their heads. I mean, you think that, you know, ISIS is bad cutting off 21 people's heads? Look what God says. I mean, this is the God of love. This is the God of mercy. This is the God of compassion. This is my God, whose definition is love, saying, I will do these things. Don't make any mistake. I will wipe out even those who have acquired of God. Not a pretty picture. Be silent in the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, he has invited his guests. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes, and I will punish the king's children, and I will punish all those and such as are clothed with foreign apparel. And I will in that day punish all those who leap over the threshold and who fill their master's houses with violence, will I cut them off, and with deceit will I cut them off, for they have committed violence, and they have committed deceit. And there shall be on that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry 
from the fish cake. Now, I happen to know that, you know, this is pretty bad stuff. This is pretty major stuff. This is pretty good stuff that as far as you want disaster, the master of disaster is telling you that something's going to happen and it's coming down in a real big way. So that's why I said to you, you know, hey, you want to go with the Lord when he goes to pull back the Spirit of God to heaven because, frankly, if you're not there at the banqueting table, all hell is going to break loose on the earth. And this is what not only has been fulfilled in the past, but is going to be fulfilled in the present day because the great tribulation is coming our way. Yes, these things that were written unto you from Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 1 through 10, are going to still be fulfilled. Now in verse, oh, it's the rest of 10, is a wailing from the second quarter and a loud crashing from the hills. That's technically in Jerusalem, the second quarter is a part of, the, like you could say, the Jewish quarter and the Gentile quarter and the Christian quarter and the you know, Muslim quarter and all those quarters. Well, there you go. You got it covered for the second quarter. And starting now in verse 11, we're going to talk about and get to you know, more of what God is saying. So let's pick it up in verse 11. Wail! Ooh. You inhabitants of Makdesh? Huh. I almost wanted to say Mark Markesh. Close enough. Probably fits. For all the merchant people are cut down. Oh no, is that America? Capitalism, eat your heart out. Because that is what a merchant people is. People like to say capitalism doesn't come from Babylon. That it doesn't come from Egypt. That it doesn't come from, well, you know, you name it. Capitalism is of the world, by the world, for the world, and in the world, and of the world. It's a satanic thing, but of course it is a also business thing. So. Business is business, but it's also the business of the Gentile, the business of the world. The children of Israel were told not to have business normally, but to take care of the stranger in their midst, to do things that were not part of capitalism. It wasn't always about you making a living and earning money in order to sustain yourself, but it was about taking care of those who couldn't earn a living and couldn't sustain themselves. So at times... God doesn't really look so fondly upon those that think that capitalism is a part of God's plan for working. No, not really. For the merchant people are cut down. All those who handle money are cut off. Well, that about sums up capitalism. I mean, how are you going to get around that one, dude? <laughs> In a free enterprise, in a free democracy, in a free, you know, business is making you free to go ahead and put yourself into slavery to the aspect of working for a living because that's what you're doing. You're working for a living. So are you free? You say you are, but you're not. You're part of the system. Capitalism. So what is capitalism? Let me make it in a very biblical term for you. Capitalism is those that handle money and capitalism is those that are merchant people. So let me ask you about the merchant people that handle money. What's going to happen to them? Well, let's be clear. Well, you inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down. All those who handle money are cut off. Well, that only applies to Maktesh. Let the hear hear according to what they want to hear, because, buddy, dude, if that's what you got out of that, it's only for Maktesh. May you be blessed in your merchants, may you be blessed in your mercantile system, and may you be blessed in your... Capitalism, but such as it is, and you handle money, hey, dude, you know, I got blessings for you and I got curses. And you know what? Before the blessing and the curse, I think you better go ask God what it means. Because you may be surprised about what Maktesh means. It may blow your mind. <laughs> Boom. It's like, wow, God is not shocked about what you have to do to be a business. He knows. He knows. And it came to pass, now we're getting somewhere. What came to pass? At that time, that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Matter of fact, the Lord doesn't do evil or good. God doesn't do anything. God's not dead, but he's surely not alive. He's not inside. He's not outside. God isn't in the storm. The storms happen naturally. God isn't in the hurricane. The hurricanes happen naturally. God isn't in 
the storm or the hurricane or the stars that fall from the sky or the area that's been grown up or the places, you know. God is far away. He started creation and he left for a while, you know. I mean, God's gone. God's not there. God doesn't do these things anymore. God, you know, after all, I mean, a strong wind came up, but that wasn't God. That was kind of like, you know, it happened coincidentally, you know. But God, no, he doesn't intervene in the affairs of man. He's not in that, you know, 21 beheadings. You know, he isn't in, you know, like, every single circumstance. Never mind if the hairs of your head are counted. That's some angel doing it, you know. But that's not God. God doesn't get that detail. God doesn't do exactly like he said. God doesn't do exactly like he did. God doesn't do exactly like he said. God doesn't, do, God doesn't do exactly like we read, but God does what he, you know, we want him to do, you know, and he doesn't really do anything. At least that's what God is saying he's going to do with these people who say that God will not do good and God will not do evil. Because God hasn't created all that stuff, so he's not going to do either one. But, you know, they're settled in their complacency coming up with these excuses for what they ignore God is doing in trying to warn them according to all these things that have come upon the world. Therefore, their goods shall become booty. And I don't mean no booty in the backside, honey, and you're drunk, because that drunk junk that you're hanging around in your booty, it ain't no good for anybody else, but that booty is yours. So you got to do with what you've got in the trunk, and that's a bunch of junk. But what you're going to find is that the junk that you've got in your trunk and the junk that you're hauling around in your house and the junk that you're involved in, when you say God don't do good and God don't do bad and you think that you're safe because you're not in Jerusalem but you're in America, hey, guess what? Here it is, bluntly. Therefore their goods shall become booty, taken away, stolen, removed from them. Your Harley is gone. Bye-bye. Someone else is riding it now. It ain't going to heaven with you. And their houses of desolation, they shall build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hastens quickly, and the noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. Is that the gospel? <laughs> Honey, it is. I got news for you. The gospel, I mean, you know, if you are doing these things, the gospel is bad news, sort of. I mean, you know, if you want to stay there, yeah, it's bad news for you. You know, if you really want to be involved in capitalism only, i got bad news for you. If you want to be like, you know, thinking God isn't involved in everything in your life, well, i got bad news for you. If you think God doesn't judge or God isn't going to come down and do all these things in this generation, well, i got bad news for you, you know, I mean... You could look at this as bad news, I suppose. I'm kind of looking forward to it. <laughs> There's another place in Scripture where it says that he shall laugh at them, meaning God. And I'm like, yeah, me too, because I think it's funny. God doesn't say you can't have capitalism. He says that look what happens when you do capitalism. You know, you get puffed up, you get bought up, you get fixed up, you get set up. You know, you buy houses, you buy property, you get involved in taxes, you get involved in... Security, you think you gotta buy a gun, and then you gotta buy a security alarm system, and then you think that you're gonna protect it, and then, you know, what happens? Some earthquake comes along and destroys it, or you have a mudslide and your house is wiped out. Where's your security system? You know what I mean? Your security system didn't prevent you from a mudslide, did it? It didn't stop the, you know, like, asteroid from wiping it out. It doesn't stop God from coming by and saying, hey, you ain't living it. You know, you can build it, but you ain't gonna live in it. What do you think you are here for? I mean, that's the point of what all this is going to when it comes to good news versus bad news. You're not here to occupy and make your house your castle. You're not here to buy up land and make yourself, you know, fiefdoms and kingdoms, you know, and set yourself up as, you know, hey, I got my own little house, kind of like, you know, flipping houses routine here. You know, I got properties and I got money and I'm doing this and doing that. And now that you're the richest nation in the world, and the richest people in the richest nation in the world, let me ask you this. Was Jesus kidding when it said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? How hard do you think it is for an American to get into heaven? It ain't going to be easy, honey. you got to re-examine where you're at to find out if you're at where Jesus said you should be at with your prosperity. Are you riding a Honda? Do you have the latest car? Are you buying bigger and better guns? Are you accumulating wealth for yourself? Oh, well, you know, I do contribute to the church, you know. It's a good write-off, you know. Well, you know, I do give, you know, to the poor. 
it's a good write-off. And, you know, even though I don't write that off, hey, you know, they, they keep them at bay. You know, I don't bring them home. God knows I wouldn't want them in my house. Huh. Oh, shudder to think of the idea. Wow, you know. As long as we can set up a house over there for them, you know, that's okay. But don't bring them home. Ooh, what would happen if you did that? Hmm. I don't know. They might rip me off of my possessions. You see, that's what God's saying, is that your possessions have possessed you. That's all. What do you think they call them possessions for? They possess you. That's all. That's all a possession is. How do you know if you got possessions? They possess you. Do you think about them? I mean, can you take, like, this shirt, you know, this... My wife knows that she hates when I do this because I threw away a couple shirts already, you know. She says, quit doing Bible studies on possessions. You keep throwing things away. And I'm like, well, I got to make the point, Lord. You know, I got to make the point, honey. They don't understand unless I tear it up and shred it in front of them. <laughs> no, my wife knows, hey, you know, there is nothing. And this is true. She knows. Nothing in this house where I rent, nothing in this ministry that I do, nothing that I've accumulated in the physical realm will I not give up instantly without question or hesitation or even dump it in a dumpster as fast as I can if someone dares me or even challenges me and thinks for a second that I can't give it up. That me, buddy. Watch this. Poof. You know, and then condemnation comes on them because they didn't pray about whether God sent them to me. And then I go, hey, God, look, I'm demonstrating to you because they think that I can't do what you have told me to do, not be possessed by my possessions. So, you know, you go look at your Harley and tell me where you're at. I already know because if you got a Harley, you're already full of ego and it's pride that you bought it. If you didn't buy a Harley and you can't admit it's pride, be honest. Come on, why did you buy the Harley brand name in the first place? It's not the best motorcycle out there. It's the pride. It's the ego. And until you realize and recognize that, you're not going to crucify yourself to it. And God isn't going to give it to you because you're using it, you say, for the kingdom of God. And yet at the same time, you can't give it up. Walk away. Same thing with ministry. Can you walk away from your mega ministry? If you can't, it possesses you. You are possessed in Christian ministry. That's what God is saying here. He's not messing around in Zephaniah. He's talking directly to you and to I. And I'm telling you, I have been challenged by this book many times in my life. I have been overly busted and done things about it in my life in order to come to the place where I can tell you, hey, I like what I got now. I own nothing, possess nothing, and nothing possesses me, and nothing owns me. I am free to be who I am in Jesus. And Jesus has set me free, and I am free indeed. And so their houses shall become a desolation, and they shall build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. They, there the mighty man shall cry out. You know, that's the other thing that's sad. Who's your hero? Who's your idol? Who do you look up to? Who do you watch the news for? Who do you, who do, you know what I mean? That's always, I say, who do? You know, who do you get into who? You know what I mean? Who do you? That's why I say, who do you? Because my who do you's are simply those stupid things Americans do. And everyone does it. They're into gossip. National Enquirer proved that. They're into, um, Gossip, and I can't think of the other words now that are all non-Christian virtues, but they're into backbiting, you know, and slander and gossip and all that stuff, because how did, you know, all these Hollywood movie theaters, or how did all these Hollywood commentary shows become so popular? You want to know what they're doing. Oh, so-and-so talked about, so-and-so we talked about, so-and-so went on to Twitter, did this and that and the other thing, you know, and now they're, you know, and real life, you know, Corey Hollywood Wise or some other thing. Well, no, 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 and I did that, and you did that, and no, 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 no. Nah, nah, nah. Zap of the trapper, you know, zip of the lipper. I mean, shut up. Dude, that's what the problem is with mighty men. It's mighty men and women. You know, how do 50 shades get 50 grays? Well, that's the way they did it. Because it's like, hey, people indulge. They get away with it. So they think they can do it. It's not what God is saying. Guess what he says about the mighty men? You know, it's going to get bad and it's going to get sad and it's going to get real because it's talking about everything that's elevated above you. Everything one higher notch up that you look up to rather than looking at Jesus. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, 
a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm, and against the fortified cities and against the high towers. There the mighty men shall cry out. But, but, but Lord, haven't I done all these things in your name? Okay. You could try it. I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men. Because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like refuse. Dung. Poop. Matter of fact, you could walk behind any man and you could do a pooper scooper because that's all that's going to be left of them. Once God takes their blood out of them, so to speak. Because their blood shall be poured out like dust. And all that's left is... Ugh. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. In the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will speedy riddance to all those who dwell in the land. You know, it's interesting because it already started in Jerusalem, right there, according to the top of the verse, where it's back up in 11. You know, it's back up in verse 10. So people always say, don't touch God's anointed. Oh, really? Look what God does. The God of love. The God of mercy. The God of, you know, the blessing God. You know, the God that blesses us doesn't curse us. Doesn't, you know, render it to every man according to the measure of, according to the works that he's done. Chapter 2. <laughs> wow, we're just warming up. We still got to go through some more? Oh, man, are you kidding me? I'm already, like, sweating this one out, you know, according to God's plan. What is God trying to say to me? Well, I already told you along the way. You get it today? You know, you're into capitalism. You're into If you're an American, you're into capitalism, commercialism. You're already one of the marketeers. You're already one of the handling money. I mean, you know, kind of, you know, you already think that you're, you know, the Christian nation. Well, we're not quite Christian nation anymore. Well, you're not Jerusalem, but you are like Jerusalem. So it fits, you know. We're talking about God. You think he's not talking to you? Ask him. Now you're ready for chapter two. Gather yourselves together. Gather together. O oh, undesirable nation. O oh, shameless nation. O oh, nation who thinks they've got it together. Before the decree is issued, or the day that passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes at you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, but seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. <laughs> okay, we'll stop there. We'll do Zephaniah in two parts. But let's talk about this part. Let's talk about this direct statement God is saying to you. Because the next part fits what's going on in the world today. And you'll know that this fits to all of us today. And why? Because it fits perfectly. And it goes, and I knew it was in here because, you know, every time that I read about what's going on in Israel, I go, it's already been written in the Bible what's going to happen. You know, why you guys keep trying to make something out of it that's already written about what's happening. Don't you have eyes to see? Don't you get it? You know, and I'm always talking to other pastors even saying that. And they're like, no, oh, you know, no. Fine, you know, if I'm the least of churches, because, you know, frankly, I'm outdoors, and I don't pay any money, I don't pay any taxes, I don't have any electric bill, I don't have any property bill, I don't have any rent, I don't have anything, and I'm able to go out in the church, you know, the church, then you go to church, and have a church without having anything to pay for, and nobody can contribute to, so guess what? It's all free. Free indeed. So it's a contradiction, and a, what do they call those things, those, besides the word contradiction, it's a, not anomaly, but a, um, I love the word because I hear it in sci-fi all the time that say paradigm, paradox. It's a paradox. Yeah, that's what I am now. I love being in God. I love being God's paradox right now to the church because, frankly, the church should not be charging. I mean, the church was never meant to charge for. Uh, you know, God knows that. Uh, don't get me wrapped up on that because you know we were talking about commercials earlier. I hate to get into this topic, but I'm going to talk about this topic for one second. If your church is charging you fifty bucks a pop to go to a Bible study, get out. Get real. Get away from it as far as you can. You're not going to learn anything from it. 
If they're charging you 20 bucks or 50 bucks, 100 whatever they're charging you, get away from them. God never intended you to be merchandised. You're being merchandised by a mercantile system to get what you want from God that God won't honor in the end anyways. You're going to find it's a waste of time. It really is. I found that out a long time ago at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. My buddy that was a roommate at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, he used to teach the children's ministry. And he was a guard at, you know, the Sunday and Friday night worship service. You know, they had these books out that, you know, everybody was, you know, reading and I went and looked at it, you know, and it was like, you picked up the book, it was like 25 bucks, you know, and it was like Christian counseling, and I looked at it. I said, hey, Norm, can I read this? You know, he goes, yeah. Didn't say a word, you know. So I took it out of his bedroom, you know, and I, you know, and looked at it, and, you know, it was one thick book, you know, like, you know, I read it for cover to cover, and I gave back to him, and he, and he said, I said, he said, he didn't say, what do you think? And I, I think I asked him, I said, did you read it? He goes, yeah. I said, what did you think? And he goes, waste of time. I said, it was. And it is. I mean, Christian counseling boils down to one-on-one -on -one with the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's what it was. You know, I mean, that's what Christian counseling is. It's, you got the Holy Spirit. God gives you word of wisdom, word of knowledge, what to say, what to do, what to be, and everything else. And let God operate according to what he does. You know, and it's with the word and in him and in them. And then guess what? God does his thing and you're done, you know. Wow, Lord, you did a great job there. What did we do? <laughs> you may be as confused, but guess what? The person walks away going, wow, that was awesome. And they're gone. You're thinking you're wise, and you're going, really? Cool. But now, having said all that, anybody, anywhere, anytime, any place is charging you, and you think that they're, and you have a question in your mind. Now, if you're, you know, automatically writing the check, well, okay, go for it, you know. To your prophecy seminar, you know, 50 bucks a year. To your, you know, Bible college, 100 bucks there. To your, you know, local yokel that says, here, this, I'm a Christian financial planner. Here's, I need your 50 bucks for my videos, you know, so that I can make money off of you, so that you can make money on your own. Right. Doesn't that sound like a pyramid? Pay the church. Or, hey, I got my Christian coffee house inside the church now. I don't have to go down the street and you know, pay some heathen. I can pay the Christians that are gathered like tax collectors or like money changers inside the church. I can get my coffee right here. Charge, pay that bill, oops, pay that bill, oops, pay that bill. By the way, the church inside that's making money, honey, off the tax-free exempt status is hypocrisy. I'm sorry. If you're a church and you have a money-making enterprise inside your church, and you're using your tax exempt status in order to do that, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You are, let me finish it, a hypocrite. That's not what church is for. Don't put a Christian restaurant inside of a church and call it, because you got tax exempt, part of the church. You're a hypocrite. It's a business. Be real. Get out, out in the street with the world and the worldly and ungodly and treat it like a business. Otherwise, don't tell me it's a ministry. That's a lie. Don't be a hypocrite. Enough of that. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth. You see, the meek are going to inherit the earth, but also more because God starts with the humble. God starts with the brokenhearted. God starts with the sinner and works his way up to the saint. You want to find who's got God operating in their life? Go find the least of these. You want to find who's really, you know, like walking with Jesus? Go find the 90, leave the 99 behind, go find the one. Why did he run? Because God was working on him. God's with him. God's doing something. We got it backwards, folks. Don't look at what you think. Do what God says. The meek who have upheld his justice. The meek, how could the meek uphold his justice? I thought the meek were the ones that, you know, I thought the, 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 a-type personalities were the ones that were going out and stand up for God, stand up for justice, stand up for abortion, stand up for political parties, stand up and follow our Christian right, stand up and follow the righteous, what are they called? The Republicans. Oh, stand up and follow the righteous Republicans. Be like Franklin Graham and speak out on everything political, but forget about the gospel. You know, do this and do that and be this and be this. That's not meek. That's weak. The meek are tender, hidden, quiet, but they're saying, God, justice for us, justice for those that are oppressed, justice for those that are poor and lowly, who have upheld his justice and seek righteousness and seek humility. you got to seek humility, folks. You don't go out and sign a petition 
You don't go out and start arguing and debating and fighting. You go out and trust in the Lord with all your heart. You lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He directs your path. If God does for some reason, God knows it's between you and Him, tell you to go start some petition and some drive or whatever, okay, you know, maybe God's going to use them some way. I don't know. But the majority of people I see, God didn't tell them to do it. They did it because they're saying, hey, I know I have to stand up for righteousness. If good men don't do something, evil will flourish. Really? I think I heard evil somewhere back here in Zephaniah. Uh, let's see. Who say in their mind, or let's see, who are settled in complacency and say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Ooh. And God bless them for that? The Lord doesn't do evil. It may be in the blessing. You will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. It may be. And that's the point I wanted to come and bring to you about, as far as, you know, all of this is concerned in Video Bible, Video Church, in all that we do, and all that we say, and all that we believe in, and all that we hope for, and all that we want to accomplish. It may be that God has told you to do what you're doing. Then do it. Whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, we support every church if the Lord tells them to do it. We support the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in one way. You know, if you have Jesus in your heart, if you are following Jesus in your soul, if you have made the Lord your God, Jesus, Lord your God, meaning the Father, Son, Spirit, if you made Jesus Lord of your life and you are walking with Him and talking with Him and He's talking to you and He tells you to stay in the Mormon Church, hey, then be a part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to say, you got to get out of there. Well, but the Lord told me to stay there. Well, then stay there. I'm not going to tell you to get out. Or if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you know, and God knows, you know, I can think of more reasons to get out of there than out of the Mormon Church, but still, either one, I'd say get out if it was just me, but of course not, it's not. You know, it's about what the Lord is telling you to do. But, you know, both of them, I would say, well, not the best place to be, but it's not the worst. I can think of worse. Been there, and I've done them <laughs> as a Christian. But, you know, you know, Jehovah's Witness, you know, I mean, if you're in there and, you know, you think you're doing right, well, the Lord hasn't told you to get out, don't get out. But seek the Lord, and then once you do talk to Jesus, then if Jesus tells you to stay there, do what he tells you to do. There I am, even again. There go the fireworks. People are going to condemn me again. Oh, no, God's going to wake you up. No, he's not. I'm telling you as a believer. I'm telling you as a Christian. I'm telling you as someone who has the Holy Spirit inside Whatsoever the Lord is telling you to do, there's a reason. I don't know what that may be. <clears throat> but just as we say to trust the Lord with all our heart, leaning not in our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging Him, let Him direct our path, because He will. James 1.5 says, If you lack wisdom, ask of God. If God tells you, hey, God didn't tell Abraham to be a child molester, or did He? Frankly, I'd have locked that sucker up and kept him as far away from his son as possible. There would have been no way that Abraham would have had the opportunity to sacrifice his son. And if anyone thinks that that's not how real it is, that's how real it gets. Because today it would not have happened. But back then, hey, you know, killing your kid, well, you can get away with it. Couldn't you? Or could you? You may want to think about that one. Be careful. What God tells you to do, that's what you should do. And Abraham's the father of our faith. It starts there. It only gets downhill from the rest of the way. Even Jesus saying, love your enemies. You think you can get away around that after everything else that God has done? After everything Jesus is saying or God is saying in the word in Zephaniah today, in chapter 1, or chapter 2, verse... Chapter 2, verse 3, when he says, seek the Lord. You think I'm going to change that in some way? No, I'm not telling you to seek men. I'm not telling you to seek wise counsel. I'm not telling you to seek any other way. I'm not telling you to seek the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints or the Jehovah's Witnesses or Calvary Chapel or your Bible or your own interpretation or your explanation or wherever it is that you go to get something that makes you feel good about what you're doing. No, I'm going to tell you, seek the Lord. Because, you know, the children of Israel aren't any different than who I am. We're talking about Jews here now. We're talking about Jews who said, I know the Lord. And they didn't. 
We're talking about Jews that even at the time that Jesus came said, hey, we know God. Don't tell us who our father is. And Jesus says, your father's the devil. You don't even know who your father is. And I can tell you this. Anybody that's born of the daughter of Eve, you know, that's born of a woman, guess what? Our father is Satan. The flesh is evil. I'm sorry. If you don't know that, you got to grow up to that. you got to own it. Because God said you must be born again. So I don't care what church you go to. If you're not getting what God wants to tell you, you need to get it from somewhere, as we started this off, and get right, or get personal, or get real with God, and then find out what God has to say. Because if it isn't God directing you today, you're going to hell. For we know, because he said so, that if you have the Son, yeah, you have life. But if you don't got the Son, if you just have faith, I'm glad for you, but you're going into great tribulation. Just like they said in Nephaniah. We got faith. We, we, we believe. Just like in Zephaniah farther up, go back and reread it. Look at who he's talking to, Christian. Look who he's talking to, capitalist. Look who he's talking to, America. It's not enough to just have faith. I'm sorry. Grace applies, but that grace might take you into great tribulation. It doesn't say you'll be spared the great tribulation. That's a blessing that's given to some. Many called, few chosen. Two shall be walking in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. Two asleep, one in the bed, one in nine, you know, taken and left. Pray that you be counted worthy, Jesus said. Paul said, I beat myself down that I may be counted worthy to be spared all these things that are about to come upon the world, but are about to come upon all things. I mean, the man who did more than I would imagine most of us do in a lifetime, is still working hard to keep himself in, not just the love of God, but to keep himself in the will of God. Because, you see, I don't know where you're going to go. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know if you're going to be in the Great Tribulation. I don't know if you'll be spared those things. According to Zephaniah, we have a perfect definition of who's going to be spared the Tribulation and the Great Tribulation that will become upon the world. And he says it in a peculiar way interesting, intimate, personal way. He says in Zephaniah, according to the word of the Lord, as it starts off in Zephaniah when it says, I will, and then says the Lord, and goes on and on and on, and then it says in Zephaniah chapter 3, seek the Lord all you meek of the earth. Are you meek of the earth? First of all, I think you might want to get there, but even if you're not, well, you know, it may be that you may be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Uh, Christian, born again Christian, Jesus freak, Jesus person, Jesus gypsy, me, you, us, them, whoever, wherever, however. Nowhere does it say you get a positive stamp seal of approval. You're going. You don't get it because you don't got it. Because God wants you to trust him. Not to assume that you do get to go somewhere that he never promised anyone they were automatically going. The letter to the seven churches, whether you take it as a historical, whether you take it as was, is, and ever shall be, or that was, and it is today, and it is going to be accomplished, or that you take it as all of it, always, applies, anytime, anywhere, any place, always, anytime, any place, anywhere, any way, that God chooses to use it. So today... Even in the letters to seven churches, one out of seven and 50% of that's not too good in odds. I don't know about you, but I don't play odds maker, but probability factors, seeing such as they are, scientifically speaking, yeah, you know, it's not so good. Hmm, hmm. And in the parable of the ten virgins, even five were looking. They were looking. You get this? They're looking for their master's return. The five that didn't go. Oh. No. Oh, whoa. Yeah. Just like it says in Zephaniah. Whale. So, I got good news for part two. I got bad news for part two. The good news is part two carries on and tells us about something that's going on in Israel right now, today. The bad news is, well, you know, part one, it applies to today, to you, and to me. The good news is, we're given that you may be spared these things. That you could be, you know, if you're meek of the earth, you know, maybe you need to kind of consider where you're coming from. If you're in pride or you're in capitalism or you're in all these things, even a Christian, 
as he talks to Christians and everybody in Zephaniah, who, but, offers hope for them all. Seek the Lord. Now, I like that part. That's the good news, and that's what we'll end with. You see, that's really what Zephaniah is saying about all of it. The prophets, the teachers, the masters, the leaders, the servants, the slaves, the heathen, the ungodly, the godly. God doesn't really spare a nation. He will pull out once in a while those that are righteous, as we know about Lot, you know, and Sometimes he'll spare people because of the prayers of people, like we know with the children of Israel, because of Moses at the Sermon on, or at Moses, at the Sinai, you know, conversation that God and Moses are having when God says, I'm wiping them out, and Moses says, no, don't do it. And he winds up saving, you know, the children of Israel because God was going to wipe all of them out. And we'd be um, no longer called about Jewish because there'd be no Judah, We'd be probably Moses because we'd be Moses, noses, <laughs> wandering around with these big noses. Think of the grain of salt. But the fact of the matter is, Abraham sought the Lord, not the will of the people. He didn't stay in Canaan. He didn't stay with the tradition of his fathers. He heard the Lord and did what God told him to do. Moses sought the Lord. He tried to do what he thought was the right thing to do and failed miserably. Today, you're in the same place. You might think you know what you're doing and you may have heard God speak at times, but you might do something like Abraham and you may have failed in doing it by creating a lot of Ishmaels running around. A lot of fruits of your labor that really weren't what God said. It wasn't what God meant wasn't in the way or the means that God intended. And you've suffered from that. Well, admit it. I mean, if Bob Coy, who was just prior to his stepping down, declared the biggest church, the biggest mega church in the country, was willing to step down Maybe, you know, I didn't see anybody saying they were going to expose him, but step down from the ministry. What's so bad about being good? I mean, what's so wrong with being and admitting the truth? I can admit to you that, you know, not everybody's going in the rapture, and then you can live accordingly. And then you can prepare for those things. If you're there, praise the Lord after the trap rapture. If you're not, praise the Lord. But whether you live or whether you die, you live unto the Lord. It's not about your church, whether it's Calvary Chapel, a uh, Catholic church, a Protestant church. I know Ash Wednesday is starting today, so it's kind of a good, appropriate time to read Zephaniah Part 1. But, you know, seek the Lord. That's what the point of Zephaniah is. All the way, even when we get in the next part, it's going to be seek the Lord. Because if you're not having a personal relationship, if you need to contact me, you can, by the way. You know, we're putting this out for Vidigo Church, Vidigo Ministry, Vidigo Bible. If you really, I mean... I'm going to qualify this because you're not going to hear what you want to hear necessarily. But if you really want to seek the Lord, I'll help you. I mean, you know, sometimes people don't want to talk to me, you know, and I don't doubt that they don't get what they want, you know, because I'm going to fl I'm going to play Bible shotgun with you. Flip open a Bible, you know. I'll tell you, hey, you got a Bible? Good. Flip it open. Read me what it says, you know, and I'll interpret it for you if I have to. But the point is, hey, I'll get you to where you'll hear from God. But are you sure you really want to hear from the Lord? Because in Zephaniah's day, they didn't want to hear it from God. They said, God doesn't do good and he doesn't do evil. That's the attitude of Christians today. Most of them think that they can just go to church and get away with what they're doing today. Because they say, well, in Zephaniah's day, the, 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 that didn't all happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it did. In 70 AD, wiped out exactly like Zephaniah prophesied. And yet, it's still going to happen. It's still going to be fulfilled. Even worse. Oh my. Lions and tigers and bears. But Jesus said, look, in the world, look around. In his day, <coughs> Roman occupation, 
Adam in his day, slavery in his day, Gentiles, oh God knows you can't deal with them. You know, Jews, <laughs> bad Jews, eh, good Jews, eh, some kind of Jews, eh, eh, eh. But, hey, you can't snooze or you lose because you can't let it go. You heard it. Oops. He's right. I did hear it. I watched. I heard. Now I'm responsible. Yeah. Now you're accountable. I'd love to tell you that you could interpret it, but you can't. It's not being interpreted. It's being said. That's all. Because you read it. And what's said that's read is read is said. Because God said it, and you read it, and that's the way it works. And that's why if you really need help to find out if you, you know, need to seek the Lord, if that's what you want to do, I'll help you do that. After that, you're on your own. Don't get me wrong. I don't want you to come to church. Go, go away. You know what I mean? I'm the only one that's going to be a preacher that's going to tell you, go away, more than I'll tell you to come and stay. Because, frankly, you know, I'm responsible for you. Go somewhere else, please. You know, I got enough accountability. I know too much. Too much is given, much is required. Ah! Ick, ooh, you, goo. I wouldn't be one of those mega pastors. God knows. Huh. <laughs> Not a chance. I would have walked away from that in a heartbeat, telling you, hey, look, you know, you're an elder, great, here, you take over. I'm gone. I got to go start something else and do what God wants me to do. God never wanted billions of people to come. He wanted the few. And he's always pruning to make the few. So, you know, if you really, you know, that offer stands. If you really want to seek the Lord, you know, and you haven't gotten the message out of Zephaniah, and you don't really understand, and you still want to, you know, you want to, you want to get real. I mean, I mean, you better be willing to get real, because I'm not... I don't pussyfoot around, you know. I'm not somebody that just says, hey, you know what, let me let me make it easy for you. you know? I'm going to tell you, look, it's going to cost you. Man. It's going to cost you what you love most. Because God gave up what he loved dearest. And because he gave his only begotten son, it's going to cost you too. Salvation is not meant to be some free gift that you just automatically say, ah, I'll take it. You know, fine, if you're going to push it on me, I'll, I'll do whatever i got to do to get it. And then you don't do it. That's not the way salvation works. I mean, I know somebody probably threw grace at you that way and said, that's what grace is, unmerited favor, so you don't have to do anything. No, the person giving the grace is giving it by way of something with an expectation of realization. When you say you believe in Jesus, Jesus comes back and says, fine, I'll agree with you, grace was given to you, and you can go with hyper grace, or you can go with this grace that you've interpreted. Now, have you done the things I said? Well, no, then I don't know you, and you don't know me, and you're going to hell. And that's the way the sheep and the goats work. That's the way it is. So, you really do have to know the Lord. And in order to know the Lord, you have to seek the Lord. And in order to seek the Lord, you got to do something about finding out what God has for you. So, God bless you. I hope you do, if you need to, call me. But if not, I, you know, I'm thrilled with, you know, what you're doing. You know, go for it. You know, wherever you are, whatever you, however you are, whatever you're doing and whatever you're doing. You know, whether you're a Calvary, like I said, or a Protestant, or a Baptist, or a, you're doing Ash Wednesday today, or you're doing, you know, Lent, or you're doing, you know, wherever you're going, and doing, and being, and living, then, you know, hey, according to the measure of faith you've been given, you know, seek the Lord. But if you are seeking the Lord, then you better be doing what He tells you to do. And I hope that is where you're at today. Because if it's not, then you'll find yourself in Zephaniah chapter 1 and chapter 2, where we've begun, and where we finished this Bible study. God bless you. God keep you. God, I pray, may he be listening to you and cause his face to shine upon you in such a way that he can say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because if he can't, then he's going to tell you the same words that Zephaniah said. Because that is God speaking. It's not Zephaniah's words, but it is the word of the Lord.